breaking the wall of sustainable chemistry. How modern alchemy can lead to inexpensive and clean technology. Paul Turek, Princeton University. I was in high school in Doylestown, watching ABC News with my mother. So thank you. Uh, it's a, a true honor to be here, and I'd like to begin my talk by thanking Sebastian and all of the staff uh, who've put on this conference for an absolutely remarkable and memorable day. And I'm going to borrow uh, a line from you, and that is, you all may now applaud. Right? We should applaud all of you for putting on this wonderful conference. Thank you. So what... I'm going to begin. I'm a professor, so I have to give you a quiz. You're falling asleep. Probably it's late in the day. So the question is a simple one, and that, that is, what do these molecules, or these uh, common household items have in common? So these are pharmaceuticals, moon boots, so the bottom of your shoe, envelopes, or fuel cells in a car. I mean, how disparate could we get? Well, I, I kind of gave it away, but one of my objectives here this afternoon is to convince you these are all molecules, and these are all molecules that synthetic chemists need to make, and we need to make them in a sustainable way. And one of the other uh, aspects of this, and one of the things I want to convince you of this afternoon is, you need to look at the entire system to understand this concept of sustainability. And so one of the problems with all of these materials that I show you is, all of them, somewhere in the stream of preparing them, rely on something very precious and very valuable, a thing we call in chemistry a catalyst, something that enables a reaction by speeding it up. So oftentimes, it's a concept that deals with economics, which we've heard a lot about today. So what are these things called precious metals? Precious metals are, are these elements in the nether reaches of the periodic table, highlighted there in blue. So elements that sound very exotic to you, probably platinum. If you have a very good credit card, you might be a, a frequent flyer, you might be a platinum member. But certainly not iridium or rhodium. If I told you you were a rhodium flyer, you would probably run away from me. <laughs> but these, these uh, believe me, you'd want to be rhodium. Rhodium is better than platinum. <laughs> And if you learn nothing else from me this afternoon, I'll give you some advice. I'm not an economist, but invest in these metals. Always a safe investment. So platinum, we use about uh, 8 million ounces per year in car uh, catalytic converters. So there's a pile of them thrown away. That's actually a very valuable uh, dump now of, of waste material. Uh, in jewelry, because it looks pretty, we use about 3 million uh, ounces. Okay, so what's the problem? So the problem is, is what we're trying to do is, is to eliminate these precious resources from our syntheses. And so you may know of this concept of alchemy. This is the origin of chemistry. The word chemistry actually is derived from the word alchemy. And back in medieval times, these often, let's say, shady fellows were using black art to try to convince people that you could convert abundant elements like lead, which is known as a base metal, into something more precious like gold. And this is exactly the concept that we're trying to do now in chemistry that we think is important to sustainable chemistry. But of course, we're not trying to use black magic. We're trying to use the techniques and understanding of, of the laws of chemistry in order to do this. And so one of the projects in my laboratory in, in Princeton is to try and take something like iron and convert it into platinum, but not actually for use in jewelry, but actually by function. Okay, so that's the idea of modern alchemy, is that can we get these abundant base metals to function like the precious ones do. And I'll give you a few applications of this. As, the, as Chancellor Merkel told us earlier today, this isn't a new concept. She's, I was going to tell you it was 100 years old, and then she said it was 200. And that's true. So here is the most important chemical reaction that's practiced in the world. This is known as the Haber-Bosch reaction. It was discovered right here in Germany uh, at the turn of the last century. And uh, the most important molecule there is the one ammonia, NH3. This molecule keeps half of the population alive. If that doesn't impress you, that molecule is the source of half of the nitrogen atoms that are currently in your body from what you eat. And the problem was, BASF knew that they wanted to make this molecule because natural farming techniques couldn't keep up. And so the engineer who uh, accomplished this, his name was Carl Bosch. And the only element at the time that was known to promote this reaction in a way that BASF could do this to make money was a very strange one named osmium. And so in 1908, what BASF did was they bought the entire world supply of osmium. It was several kilograms, and they locked it in a safe in Ludwigshafen. And that was worth 400,000 Deutschmarks at the time. And one of the major concerns BASF had was that one of their reactors, this is high temperature and high pressure, the dawn of this kind of chemistry, they were afraid one of their reactors was going to explode. 
And they weren't worried about the safety of their workers. This is German chemistry back around 1910. Nobody cared about that. What they worried about was a reaction. So they decided to look for alternatives, and that was Alan Mitosh's job. And so he went to a very environmentally friendly element that you may have heard of called uranium. So people didn't want that. And so then ultimately he searched and he found this element. I, I, I'm, this doesn't count for my time. <laughs> Stop the clock. <laughs> it's okay? No? I can probably stand here if you can do that. It's better. It's better. It's better if I do that. Okay, I walk around too much. I get too excited about chemistry. <laughs> okay, so, so what mid oh. oh, this is complicated now. <laughs> I feel like I should be running an auction. <laughs> okay. So what ultimately he found is uh, this, this mineral known as Swedish magnetite, which is effectively today's catalyst, which is rust on dirt. You can't get any better than that. So what's the problem? Why, why don't we always use cheap metals like iron? And this is a very complicated slide, but it comes down to something very, very simple. And hopefully you can count to two. So the metals that are the cheap metals tend to do electron transfer by one. The precious metals tend to do it by two. And so you might think, well, why don't you just use twice as much of the base metal? That's not how chemistry works. The chemistry of one electron is, is bad. Usually, it's radicals. It's why you get old, why your car rusts. And so what we need to do is figure out how to stop that. And so how do we get two electron chemistry to happen? And so what you do is you look to nature. And nature has already figured this out for you because uh, metals like osmium aren't found really in nature. And so what nature has figured out how to do is these multi-electron transfer transformations. And one I show you is how you get rid of greasy substances in your liver using an enzyme called cytochrome P450. And what happens is it uses iron, but also by using the, the rest of the molecule around it to incorporate this multi-electron chemistry. So one at the metal, one at the rest of the spinach around the, the metal center. So that's how uh, nature has figured this out. So how we do this now, so here's an example I want to show you of this idea of a, of a whole system in sustainable chemistry. So that molecule on the left with all those double bonds in it that says plant extract under it is exactly that. It's an extract from a plant that people want to add hydrogen to in order to turn it into biofuel. But there's something unsustainable about that, and hopefully you can see it. That is, you need to use platinum. There simply isn't enough platinum on the planet to do this. There's not enough platinum on the planet to put a fuel cell based on platinum in every single automobile. You have to figure out how to solve this problem. And so fortunately, I have graduate students in my group who've done this, and they've taken an iron compound and figured out how to do exactly what platinum can. And so one of the things I want to tell you about are some molecules that you use every day that rely on platinum, and this is a real problem. And so this is this idea of adding a silicon, the thing with an SI, to the end of a long chain. And these molecules appear everywhere. This is the envelope. This is the bottom of your shoe. It turns out if you didn't have silicon compounds in your genes, you couldn't bend your legs. Natural fibers are simply too, are too rigid. The final one doesn't apply in Germany because you have beer purity laws here. But if you were Budweiser and you're an American beer, it turns out you ha if you're filling a million beer bottles a day, or however many they fill, you have to fill them exactly the same height, right? And so if you foam, some beer bottles may have this much beer, and, and now everyone's paying attention. I've, I've grasped the audience. I'm talking to Germans about beer. Everyone's at the edge of their seat. So you have to make sure the beer fills exactly to the same height every single time. And how you do that is you add that molecule right above it, and that's exactly what happens on a huge scale every day. And so the, this is what you want to have happen. Unfortunately, even though this reaction is practiced on an enormous scale, you get other products, and that's bad. So the, all those molecules on the bottom of the slide need to be separated and taken away. And that takes energy, and then you have to dispose of them. It can ruin the performance of the material you're trying to make. So even though these precious metals do great things, they're not perfect. And so here are some other issues with platinum. So we mine and use about 5.6 uh, metric tons a year. And this costs this industry, the silicone industry, $300 million a year. So this is a major, major problem in your beer, in your jeans, in your iPhone, all of these things. And you never heard of this before. This is a big problem. So the other thing, and here's my investment advice to you, if you extrapolate that line over time, you'll make money. It's about 5% a year on platinum. But the thing that drives the, the uh, commodity chemical industry crazy is these massive price fluctuations. And so if you're selling envelope glue, you don't want to hear from me that you have to pay three times as much for your envelope 
because the price of platinum has gone up, right? So eventually what happens sometimes is that the amount of the material, the, the residual platinum left in the material is worth more than the material itself. So you have to figure out how to get rid of this. Also, you have to worry about where it comes from. Okay, so you have domestic concerns uh, and things like that. And so here's a molecule. So the molecule in the upper right, that long chain thing with the SI at the end, turns out, I hope you used that today, that's in shampoo. So it actually is used every single day. And so we've learned how to make this molecule with no platinum in it. In fact, we've learned how to do it with iron. And so we've, and the important thing that we've learned how to do with iron is, we've learned how to eliminate all of those side products. So we have two benefits here in, in the sustainability world. We're not using a precious metal, something that's really rare and valuable. And we're, more importantly, I think, is we're not generating any other side products. We don't have any other waste, nothing to throw away. So it's this whole idea of the entire system being part of the, uh, of the chemical equation. Anybody here been to New Zealand or anybody from New, from New Zealand? What does New Zealand have more than people? Sheep. Everybody knows that. So I want to tell you how uh, molecules have actually changed the sheep herding industry in New Zealand. And so there are some beautiful sheep next to this pretty yellow flower. And that pretty yellow flower is known as New Zealand gorse. And in fact, you say, what is wrong with this? What is the incompatibility of sheep and New Zealand gorse? Well, it turns out if you're made of wool and you walk next to this stuff, you can see the thorns. And so one of the problems that the sheep farmers had in New Zealand is that the, you know, you'd have to go out and unstick your sheep from that bush. And if you have 12 to 1 sheep to people, then that takes a lot of your time. <laughs> this is exactly why I went to graduate school to get a PhD, right, to figure out this problem. So a molecule changed this. One single molecule changed this entire problem, and it's the molecule up in blue above the leaf. And what this thing is called is called a super spreader. And what a super spreader does is there's purple food, dot, food coloring on that leaf. If you just put water and food coloring on the leaf, you get that nice little spherical capillary action. If you put about a percent of the super spreader in there, notice that same volume of that drop spreads out completely over the leaf. This is, this is sustainable, this is green chemistry. Because now if you put 1% of this molecule into something like a herbicide, you can use that much less of it on your field. And I show you the statistic on the slide that 90% of the herbicides that we use end up on the ground. And so if you can use less, obviously that's much better. In fact, these molecules were introduced to the citrus farmers in Florida. They were very re resistant to adopting them. And the reason why is because if you tell someone that their livelihood is based on their crop to use one-tenth of what they normally use, they won't believe you. And it's, it's these issues of change that we've heard a lot about today. So what this molecule did is it allowed chemists to basically eliminate gorse from New Zealand. And so how it's made is, uh, uh, industrially is from this platinum catalyzed process where you, again, use a platinum compound and you put a silicon on the end of the chain. But unfortunately, there's another molecule that says malodorous underneath it that's made at the same time. I didn't know what malodorous meant either until I started working on this, and it means it smells really bad. And so what you have to do to get rid of that, because the people who buy this stuff don't want a chemical that smells. Now they're coming to take me away. That's not a good sign. So then you do a second precious metal catalyzed reaction with rhodium. There's that other weird element. And you actually have to get the double bond out so it doesn't smell anymore. And so what we've learned how to do is, again, to do this with iron, so we don't use any precious metals like platinum. But again, this idea of sustainable chemistry and green chemistry there's no other side product. So there's not that second step. There's not that other smelly chemical that's made at the same time. And this is very attractive for when you're making things. Remember, these compounds are made on huge, huge scales. And so if you can eliminate 5% or 10% waste, you're having an enormous impact. And so finally, what I'll leave you with is uh, envelope glue. So remember I told you about all these crazy molecules or crazy seemingly disrelated things in the beginning of the talk. And so it turns out that what you do is now you can take these you can take two silicon compounds and connect them together. And it turns out that most times when you lick an envelope, that's exactly the molecules that you're putting together. And it turns out that there's a little bit of platinum in that every time you do that. And so uh, here's the fun of science. So when we first were asked to do this by this company, Momentive, uh, this was our first catalyst. We thought we were rich because that looked like glue to us. Um, apparently, people don't want to lick black glue. <laughs> So we had to go back to the drawing board. And it turns out that the stuff that's made from platinum 
is shown there on the, on the left where the thing that says Karstedt's catalyst, that's the name for a platinum catalyst. And then one of our new iron catalysts, the material is on the right. So we went from this black stuff that would scare people away to some stuff that's exactly the same as what uh, the, is made industrially. And this is all through working with molecules and making rational changes and learning how to improve what you've got. So what I want to conclude with is that this idea of modern alchemy is true. You can get iron to perform the functions of platinum. And one last thing is that there are other heroes of the story. I don't do any of this myself. We work in a team. And uh, I think they're back in Princeton, hopefully watching this. So uh, hi. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'm finished. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>